Hey, thanks for listening to The Create Unknown. To unlock the extended bonus conversation, sign up at patreon.com slash thecreateunknown. Now, on with the show. It's just, it sounds easier. A lot of this stuff sounds easier on paper than it is You need some cash? What do, I, what do I got on me? What do I got on me right now in my wallet? Let's, let's get started. I got Dude. Three, 350 on me. No, 450 in cash. All right. All right. I'll probably need more than that. Welcome to the Create Unknown. I am Kevin Lieber. With me, as always, is Matthew Tabor, who is in Las Vegas right now, joining us remotely, and also joining us remotely from the Pat the NES Punk Castle on the West Coast is Pat Contry, <laughs> the author of the brand new Ultimate Nintendo Guide to the SNES Library, 1991 to 1998. Here is my copy of your latest 900-pound tome of video <laughs> game knowledge <laughs> welcome pat uh thanks for the thanks for the quick cheap plug kevin and it's castle country if you listen to the podcast it's, it's uh i've been here for two years now at this house in san diego a lovely place and uh thanks for having me on thanks for the thanks for the the 24-hour warning to do this podcast but i love i love you kevin we go back wow six seven years at least at this point even though we don't talk often we i have a feeling we ever we are of like mind in some ways and, and Matt, I've spoken to you once, so I'm not sure we are of like mind yet. But that's probably a good thing for you because I don't think you want to be like me. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't so. want to be like either of you. And it's, yeah, it's, it's probably a good. There's thing. enough discomfort having to be around Kevin this much when you know clearly not a role model, not anybody <laughs> I would aspire to be. So yeah, I hope we get along better because I can't handle two of those situations at once. <laughs> Did you know Kevin before or after the Jerry Bloop videos? Before. Yeah, I, I knew and you him stick there, and you well stuck before. around. <laughs> yeah, and I still have uh, I still have the Julius Bloop uh, T-shirt, which which I wear periodically. Um, okay. Yeah, I love the Jerry Bloop videos. I mean, that was oh god, it was so funny. It was just so funny, like not I, not funny out. enough, not funny enough to to give me a <laughs> career though. So they, Jerry well, Bloop had to die. Well, well you have we a career about though. it, yeah. And and I think that's a good thing to to. to to talk about is that wherever you start off on YouTube doesn't necessarily mean where you end up in terms of content creation and you carry the skills with you. You marketed yourself, you created a brand, even though that was a, it was a cult like brand. I loved it. I had it, you know, I, I posted it on my site, you know, and so I, I don't think that's a bad thing, uh, you know, because not all creations are for everyone and sometimes it doesn't reach the audience it was supposed to. Who knows if that was on, if that was on, for example, Adult Swim, that could have blown up. If, if, it, it was, if there was an audience, yeah. that, it could have blown up showing that at one in the morning. And I'm not and saying we've that talked to about smoke. That. Yeah, we've talked about that before, how uh, I, I sincerely do not believe or uh, that uh, Jerry Bloop stuff was uh, didn't have an audience or was bad or not funny or whatever. No, absolutely not. I think it was like seven years too soon. And I think that if Jerry Bloop had dropped in 2017 or 2018 or even right now i think <laughs> like people are all over it well yeah it's, part- it's very very uh it's it you can you can memorize it if that's a word probably fairly easily yeah i think the i think the problem and now now all of a sudden we're just like getting into jerry bloop but the, i think the problem with jerry bloop was that since it was a character that didn't play as well as the actual person being silly. So mm. my, my, you know, contemporaries at that time, one of which was John Tron. And John Tron was not a character. He was just John Tron. A persona. Th- yeah. yeah. It was like a persona of John. It wasn't like John was playing some character named Jerry Tron. <laughs> and, and and John is is funnier than than I was. Obviously, he's I gone dis, on I to disagree with that, but okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, he's more successful at comedy than I than I ever was, and I feel like, you know, the the people who are funny today in kind of like the video game world, like Nakey Jakey, for instance, 
again, he's just Nakey Jakey. He's not, you know, like on YouTube, Miranda is like the only one I can really think of who played yeah. like a weird character. Like that's not Colleen. She's Miranda. And that really worked yeah. for her. But it ha- that, yeah. that hasn't really worked, I don't think, very well for a lot of YouTubers. It's still working for James Rolfe? He, but then again, you can make the argument he's an institution. So he was like one of the first, if not the first, to really create that sort of character that became the brand. And it's 13 years on on YouTube where they're still going strong. They still get over, over well over a million views, each one that comes out like once a month. So I guess your, mile, your mileage varies. Um, I see what you're saying, though. The audience connection with, I guess, a persona, which is closer to the real person. Uh, it's longer lasting and there's more room for growth, I guess, with an audience versus playing a, a straight character. I could, I might liken it to a, like maybe portraying a wrestling character uh, when you do a persona because it's still you, but you're kind of altering your personality a bit, but you're not really playing a full on character in most modern wrestling sense, if that makes sense, if you follow wrestling, like more and more people in wrestling use their own names or use a variation of a name. And it's really their personality, and those are the ones that kind of shine more, I guess you can say. And I guess that's what you're trying trying to get at, um, and, I, and I can't really elucidate that well, is that um, people feel more of a connection if they think it's a real person talking back to them versus a character. And maybe YouTube is not the environment where that would flourish versus, like I said, like a cable network or on mm-hmm. Netflix or a streaming service like even like Amazon, where if you put on a character like Jerry Bloop, or Pat the NES Punk, maybe there's a shot at that, since that's what you expect. You expect to see characters and stories play out. Maybe. I don't know. Too late for me either way. (laughs) What I'm hearing is that we're going to get a Jerry Bloop reboot in in 2020. That's all I'm hearing in this (laughs) conversation. Well, let's put it this way. I, I I guarantee you there's there's a hardcore fan base out there that say you did like a Patreon and said, I want to create six episodes of 20 minutes each and put out the money. You might hit it. You don't know. Um, because the, the YouTube audience has definitely changed since we started out the past 10, 11 years, people have left YouTube, people have matured and got older and the type of, uh, material that would, would have flown as popular 10 years ago is not popular. Now, if you want to talk about algorithms, you want to talk about, you know, what gets promoted. I think it's more about people age and move on. Uh, whether it's uh, radio shows or TV shows, sometimes tastes change and you get older. And maybe the YouTube audience 10 years ago was older in general because it was brand new and, and maybe now it's younger. It probably is. It's probably, you know, pre-teens and teens that dominate YouTube. And then if 10 years ago, maybe you're looking at Netflix or Amazon Prime or Hulu more now for your entertainment needs. Who knows? I'm not, I'm not making an excuse for that's why some content sort of falters or sort of falls out of favor, but there's probably something to that. I definitely think so. And I I think that I would love to go back sort of to the beginning of when I was doing Jerry Bloop and, you know, you were nice enough to to ask to to put it on your website, The Punk Effect, at the time. And I'm glad that you mentioned James Rolfe because the angry video game nerd was such a big deal when that first came out that that was genuinely one of the main reasons that I started doing YouTube because I saw what James was doing, making his own show and making his own character and, and doing skits and having special effects and, and all like baking it under this persona of reviewing these terrible Nintendo games how, how much, uh, and, and there were just not that many people doing anything like that at the time. Uh, what was your experience, you know, seeing James's videos and how did that influence, uh, you know, Pat the NES punk? Well, James and I come from not eerily similar backgrounds, but semi-similar backgrounds. That's probably why we get along well. Um, we're both from New Jersey. Uh, He's from Southern Jersey. I was from Central Jersey. And then I had uh, somewhat of a smaller film background than he did uh, before YouTube. I'd done a couple of short films. I did a feature length film in college. So I had sort of an itch to create films. I'd written a couple of screenplays. One of the reasons I moved out to the West Coast was was to be a screenplay writer, actually. And it's still somewhat of a dream of mine because I still feel that out of everything, writing's my strongest point when it comes to video production. Not not editing for sure. I can't say that editing and direction I'm okay at, but I think writing's my strongest suit. It's what I'm the most natural at. Um, so when I saw James's videos, I was like, okay, here's a guy doing something that I've kind of done, cr- created films. He's into uh, video games, apparently retro games, game collecting, which was not a big thing in 2006. It was just starting to become a thing at that point. 
very slowly and YouTube helped as, along with the virtual console on Wii. So I said to myself, I've been uh, collecting games since the late 90s at that point. I said, why don't I combine the two? I, I said, not that I could do what he was doing, but I can put my own spin on it and do my own series to sort of stand alongside it. Um, and I think that's what I hopefully successfully did. One of my inspirations was the fact that at least I knew about the video games a lot more than a lot of the trash that was on YouTube at the time, which was literally people because because there was a heavy entry level uh, to YouTube uh, early on in terms of uh, knowing uh, how, not just how to edit, but also the, the uh, what you need to record for a quality yeah. video. So back then, like people were used to using like their gateway 2000 mics, you know, those long stick mics and they were, and right. they were just editing in windows movie maker and, and the quality was absolutely terrible. And they, and they were just doing a straight screen capture, you know, on the emulators and things like that, or capturing while they were you know, recording it all at the same time with little editing. So I remember watching a three stooges video, a review of the NES game. And it's probably, and it's probably still on YouTube. You can search on YouTube by like the order of, of videos uploaded. And it's probably from like 2006 or seven. And a person just, trying to play three stooges you can hear people in the background it's probably a gateway mic and he just knows nothing about three stooges and nothing about the game and ragging on it what is this why is this is not knowing that the three stooges were a famous trio that did short films you know set now 70 80 years ago he didn't and even I'll, know who the three stooges were not really so that it's like, thing would be would really confusing if you had no background knowledge. Like, why are I remember the uh, the mini games? You know, like the uh, the oyster crackers with the big spoon. Sure. Right. Yeah, and it, like if you don't get the reference on that, it's a really strange mini game to throw in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, like, that's so, weird. So I said to myself, I I could do the same sort of video, produce it better put in some jokes and more importantly, have some knowledge of the three stooges and how it incorporates itself with the game. Cause I owned that game as a kid. So at the very least I said to myself, I could do at least as well as this crappy three stooges video. I said it to myself and then I, that's where it sort of came from. Then obviously, you know, lighting's bad in the beginning. The writing's not as sharp. Establishing the character or persona. You can make an argument that Pat Dennis Punk is either more a persona or a character. I don't know. I named him the same just because I didn't want people calling me, you know, the nerd in public as I've seen happen with James still to this day. And it's awkward. So I said, I want to be called Pat at the very least. No one calls me, you know, NES Punk. People call me Pat for the most part. So, you know, it kind of kind of works out. So that's how I sort of started. And what and saw the, the journey happen with you know people not knowing my videos existed then they then they imagine that they exist and I promote it and then you get on game trailers and then you know they hits its zenith point with content like that was probably like four or five years ago the, the videos did their best and then you know a couple of years ago uh, they sort of hit a downward slide and we can get into why that happens but you know that's I don't I don't like dwelling on the trends I don't like complaining about well oh, people don't watch my videos as much as I used to I acknowledge it and I sort of move on and try to create new things and that's the advice I give to other YouTubers I don't you know I, I've interviewed YouTubers that bemoan YouTube and like oh uh, what, what can you do about it just try to the, the audience might exist somewhere else if not create content for the audience on YouTube I, I I prefer to create multiple types of content that can find themselves in different avenues because I think that's what you should do as a as a uh, as a uh, an entrepreneur and a content creator is to diversify and create different things whether it's a book or a podcast or a series on amazon prime you know things like things like that yeah the fickleness of I'm, I'm glad that you talked about how sometimes a show was really popular and now it's not anymore i mean i've certainly <laughs> uh, have faced that on vsauce too you know uh several times and i had been thinking about that somewhat recently in regards to a show called felicity that starred Carrie Russell. What? From like okay. 18, 19 years ago? Felicity? So yeah. the last so, time I thought of Felicity is when uh, I, I went I went home with uh, with Maura, uh, my girlfriend, the very first time, and we, we had to sleep in her sister's bedroom. This was for mm -hmm. Thanksgiving like two years ago. And I'm laying okay. on the bed, and I look up, and there's this big Felicity poster on the wall. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, well, you know, clearly this bedroom has been the same since like 1998 or something. Um, but yeah, that was the first time I'd thought of Felicity in almost 20 years. And now it's the first time I've thought of Felicity since then. It okay. doesn't come up a lot, Kevin. So no. explain yourself. This is, this is why it's coming up now though, because for those who don't know, <laughs> which is pretty much everybody who isn't a it's boomer yeah. listening to this, <laughs> Felicity was a show starring Carrie Russell that was very, very popular. And she had really long curly thick hair mm -hmm. sure it was and on the then, wb wasn't it was i it believe it was WB? on the wb yeah, yeah. Okay. okay so it's important to know that she had really long thick curly hair she was the main character of the show she was felicity well one day for some reason 
she cut her hair to be an extremely short and it ruined the show. People <laughs> stopped watching the show because she cut her hair. This is true. This literally happened. Huh, the main okay. character cut off her hair and people stopped watching the show. So I think this is a great example of, you know, say what you will about trends and YouTube algorithms and what audiences want and what they don't want. But you could literally have your show tank because of a haircut, let alone, you know, people feel like your your show's gotten stale over the course of 200 episodes of something. Like, that's how quickly on a dime people's interest can change when it comes to entertainment. And that was on for, that was on for four seasons only. Oh, Amy Jo Johnson from the, the Pink Ranger was on that show as the friend. Okay, now I kind of remember that. All right. Wait, are you wiki? Are you Wikipediaing yeah. it? Does it mention I, I, the haircut? <laughs> it mentions it, but it says that it might have been completed. There was a time slot change that didn't help that occur right before the haircut as well. But obviously, the haircut <laughs> didn't help. And it said that was referenced uh, within other television shows as well, like Thirty Rock, so and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So it sounds like that was that that was bad. Yeah, she had that luxurious long, like you want to say, like Disney princess hair. She had. Yeah, I remember that. Were you a fan at the time, Kevin? Did you tune in one night and see like a pixie cut and just everything you just shut it off for you? How dare you, Carrie Russell? Not not me, <laughs> you, but you tore down the poster above your bed. Nah, <laughs> I did. It's over, Felicity. You're done for. Well, we uh, a couple of weeks ago, I did uh, this workshop for uh, YouTubers in Australia who were just starting to think about uh, format and programming and all the things that that really have to develop with consistency. And one of the things we didn't quite get to that after, you know, you build up like, hey, everything's going to be great if you focus on these parts and take your knowledge of your audience and like work it in this way. The reality is that you also need to be able to murder this amazing thing at some point too. Like if it's totally viable that uh, something that was very, very good in the past just wanes to a point where you have to kill it. And knowing uh, how to do that, when to do that, and being comfortable doing it. Uh, yeah, it's like anything that's else. A big it's, deal. It, it's yeah. rare for any TV show to last even to a felicity four seasons. Most most yeah. shows are gone within two, three years. And yeah. then it's extremely rare that something lasts over 10 years. Like I, I thought about Cheers the other day. Cheers was on for about 11 years, right? Mm -hmm. I've been doing the NES Punk stuff. On and off, but I've done like 60 episodes in 11 years. I've been on YouTube. And why is it that actors and writers and directors are allowed to move on from something like a TV series, but uh, you have to keep the momentum of doing it as as a, as a, a, almost an auteur con online content creator? Why you must you be locked into that one thing? And I feel it's because YouTube's not obviously TV. It's not any other type of, of, of platform where uh, the viewers feel they have such a more intimate connection with that sort of one person usually like that's usually creating and editing and uploading the videos and that could be fine for that audience but it could be to the detriment of the of, of the content creator over time i mean I, I know a content creator that's been on the grind for over 10 years doing something or I mean, not 10 years like eight years has a lot more subscribers than me and, 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 and is looking for an exit strategy off of off of youtube entirely because you get locked in, and then if you change, your audience is fickle and it's gone. It's the same thing with Twitch. Uh, people that stream on Twitch have to uh, uh, stream the popular game at the time. If they try their own game out, they can lose. They can lose their paid subscribers. It's happened yeah. to someone I know where it's like, um, oh, I tried this game out for a few days, and I lost like half their paid subscribers for the month, and that's a direct loss of revenue. And wow. it's a, uh, I mean, it's the like, uh, what is it? Uh, Rothstein from Godfather Two. This is this is the career we've chose for ourselves. We chose to do this, but there are sort of pitfalls of being in, in the grind. Um, and the one thing I want to say, though, is that I'm not sure if it, how much the audience cares that we're even having these conversations because to them, we just churn out content. And to them, it's like, well, you're in a gifted position that you can create content and have people uh, watch it or, or, or view it or listen to it if it's a podcast. Uh, so I get that, too, because I, I have had conversations with, with people where they leave comments where it's like, yeah, I like you talking to the YouTubers, but the first 20 minutes is them bitching and moaning about YouTube. And it's like, I don't care about that. And I totally get that, mm -hmm. too. It's like, why would you care if an actor complains that, you know, oh. they don't have a, a big enough trailer while they're filming Avengers? You know, that's that's <laughs> like beyond first world problems at that point. So I understand that, too. I totally get that. It's not it's not the audience's job to care about our complaints. 
in my opinion. It's our, our job is to, to entertain. I think that's fair. And I think that, you know, you have over the years done done many things to adapt your content, whether it is going from doing Pet the NES Punk and Flea Market Madness to just doing the podcast really full time now and, and commenting on gaming news and what's going on with that. I mean, what's your schedule like? Because, you know, Matt and I, we do this podcast once a week. Uh, but uh, how often are you recording for your podcast considering, I mean, you need to, to give your opinions on breaking news more or less, right? Well, we only do it once a week and that's actually hurt the channel. So, and we used to do it only twice, uh, twice a month or once every other week up until only January, we started doing it once a week. And so I gave up my secondary not so common podcast that you were on, Kevin, uh, mm-hmm. at one point. So I was doing one, I was, I've always been doing one podcast basically a week now for the past two and a half, three years. I've been doing that. And, and no, but YouTube is all about um, not necessarily personalities anymore. It's about trending topics. So mm-hmm. I, if me, if yeah. Ian was tethered to me, and as soon as news broke, we recorded our, you know, sort of uh, on the fly hot takes that might not be founded in anything just to get it out within the first hour, the channel would have blew up. I guarantee you, because uh, Ian and I work well together. We have great chemistry, but we are behind the ball on a lot of news and that hurts on YouTube. For a podcast, it doesn't matter because pe- people realize a podcast is once a week. But mm-hmm. for the YouTube world, it, it makes us look weak. So there's other people that do this for years and do news about uh, about uh, you know trending uh, tech and video game stuff, and they get it out right away. They're not, they're not more talented than Ian and I. I can guarantee you they're not more knowledgeable. They're not better at this, but they do it first. It's like, it's like a regular news network. It doesn't matter if you're the best. You got to be first. You don't have to That's be accurate. You have to be first. Yeah, that's something, Kevin, that that you had to go through where it seemed like on Mind Blow, that was a show that people really liked. And, you know, we say this a lot, but every single video that comes out. uh, Yeah, probably. uh, uh, Every video that comes out without fail, you get dozens of comments that's like, hey, when's Mind Blow coming back? So clearly this was a good uh, good format. Everything was good about it. Um, But... It hit that point where there was probably a bit of saturation at that time with more people doing that kind of thing, but also people turning it around much faster. They they just had a setup that allowed for them to hit something. Uh, and I remember, uh, so the Boston Dynamics dog style robot, um, that came out like two years ago, you know, the one that could really like mimic a dog. Um mm-hmm. Came out about two years ago. That was one of the last episodes of Mind Blow. And I remember us talking about that. And it's like, hey, this is an amazing thing, whatever. And you you look and there are like nine people with definitive videos that uh, were already up there uh, in part because of uh, the time change. I mean, uh, there were people who were making that video in the UK when we were sleeping and they had it uploaded uh, by the time we were awake. So that urgency and timeliness uh, is is a really difficult, fickle thing, and it can cripple even successful programming. Yeah. So what does that tell you? Is it a problem with the content creator or the platform? And sometimes it could be with the content creator, but I would argue that if that's the if that's sort of the environment you're you're in, you're set up to fail because then you're you're at the whim of an algorithm and of you know of, of speed and expediency versus putting out quality content. And that's what YouTube's become more and more over the years. Definitely the past two to three years, it's, that's what it's changed into. With with it's uh, you know there was an article about the rise of the angry gamer about you know everyone railing on you know you, you basically get into this uh, algorithm maelstrom of like oh I see one person I always bring up the last Jedi because there's tons of videos that are insane like four hour videos you know why the last Jedi the last Jedi is objectionably uh, objectively bad you know things like that you watch one you get recommended for ten others. So you can spend literally four or five hours every day yeah. on one topic because that's what YouTube's feeding you. That, that's how they know you're engaged in, in the system. That's not good content, but that's what that's what that's what you're engaged with. Uh, well, it's good content, I guess, for that person that wants to, you know, have have their have their um, have their views uh, and criticisms uh, validated via random people on the internet. I guess it's okay for them, but that's not good for someone like me or you who might be better off having, you know, maybe we write episodes of, of, of edutainment up front or, or skits, and then we roll it out at our own le- leisure, like what I, I'm doing right now. I, you want to talk about what my average day is? Going back to that, today is a great example. I get up, 
I see that I can finally put my new uh, book on Amazon uh, on Amazon because the ISBN was getting rejected. It goes up on Amazon. I answer ten emails about where's my book. I send people their their uh, their shipping information. Uh, I get I get a I get a text from someone else or a tweet saying you should go on someone's podcast. They email me. I get, get in touch with Kevin. Yeah, uh, we got to record a podcast. Okay, I'll record a podcast. I go to the gym for a couple hours. I mail out. Uh, I just sold three DVDs uh, on the way home from the gym. I, I mail those out. I see my, my mail from the government, hopefully from, from the state, not suing me or what have you, from because I own an <laughs> LLC. Uh, I come back and realize, oh boy, I better get back to editing before doing before doing this. I have to go back and ed- edit a big video. A path the punk video is going to come out within a week. I, I got to finish editing that. I'm probably missing out stuff. I got to test out my app. A new version of my app is coming out. I still have to test that from yesterday. Um, I'm probably missing like two or three things, but that's my typical day. It's you're a one man <laughs> band. And yeah. I, a lot of people can't handle that. I, I, I got to think about, okay, um, how, I got to market the book because the book is still fairly new. I have to, uh, you know, send out to more influencers or people and do things like that because the book is a big chunk of my income at this point. It's not YouTube. It's not the podcast. It's all several different income sources. So, you know, that's, I guess, my quote unquote typical day. We got to talk to Ian about what we're going to talk about in the podcast next week. We still we get, we get our topics together starting, you know, five days before the next podcast. Mm-hmm. So. And I, I really want to to get your process on the book, how that came about, what you, you went through with that. But first, I really want to ask you about dealing with controversy with the podcast, because okay. you have run into some controversial moments where people are attacking you because of your hard lines on things. And as a middle child, I don't really take a lot of hard lines on things. I'm always kind of like, well, <laughs> I see this side and I also see this side. I'm like a natural kind of peacemaker in that regard. But you've taken some hard stances and Ian have taken some hard stances that have gotten you kind of into hot water. And I'd love to know your thoughts on that. And because I'm not the type of person to dig my heels in on something. Okay. Okay. And I'd love to know your perspective on that. Like, well, why would why would you listen? This this isn't against you or anyone else. But my argument is for my audience: why would they listen to me unless I was strongly opinionated? Why would you listen to me, and Ian? Like, why would you come to our podcast? This is what we've been doing for six years. Yeah, it's like we've, a, we've a always... bit like a talk radio thing. Where why would you listen to like political talk radio if somebody wasn't making hard this stands? Is, yeah, and this isn't a them. this isn't a news podcast. This isn't a newscast. This is a podcast with opinions. What the very first podcast we did in, in, in July 2013 was talking about Affleck being cast as Batman. Like, and Ian didn't go off on that like he would later, but he got into it. And within six months, talking about how awful Mike, the Michael Bay Ninja Turtles looked and, and saying and, and cursing about it. And Ian's toned down a little bit. So have I. But we we are always opinionated. And if we weren't opinionated, the podcast would have failed. As, and so you, when you say getting into hot water, I would ask you, what do you mean by that? Because people attack us on social media and they do their little YouTube videos because they want to appease their little, you know, incel audience. Like that's, that's really hot water. That doesn't affect me at all. No one has come up to me in person at any convention since you want to talk about the Diablo Immortal thing. That was a little over a year ago. I've gone to six conventions since that's happened. Not one person has come up and said, Pat, I had a real problem with that. Those aren't real people that are online leaving those harsh comments or telling me and Ian that we, we are, um, what, what, what's the thing they say? We, we are, I forget that some of the things are call, calling us cucks or what have you or whatever, whatever slang that, that they think is cool for the moment. And that's doesn't, to me, the online world like that in social media, that's not real life. And I, and I said that to Colin Moriarty. When I had him on my NASCOM podcast because he did that joke, uh, you know, a day without a woman and everyone went after him. I said, how is that really affecting you? I think you're like letting it. And he said, no, that's reductionist. Uh, these, this can affect my livelihood. And I'm like, I don't think so. It hasn't really affected anything. If you want to say you get, you get some heat on you, you lose some subscribers. I would say uh, those subscribers didn't belong anyway because they should have expected us to, to have opinions like that because it was not out of our norm. To have opinions like that, that was not the first time we gave opinions that people didn't like. Like we've talked about, uh, uh, what's what's the one thing that people came after us for that was big before that? Whenever we talk about something even tangentially related to anime and it being weird, like, you know, know, uh, giant bouncing boobs and dead or alive, we get people come after us and get downvoted. So it happens from time to time. 
Uh, so it, like, why should it bother me? Like I, the YouTube audience is, is so weird. And the people that are constantly leaving comments, like I said, those aren't, those aren't my, that's not the people that listen to me and Ian or watch my videos. I don't think so. The people that watch my videos and the people that I respect are the ones that I see at conventions, uh, like well-rounded people that don't have the time to just be online and post memes, uh, angrily at you. That's not to me a real thing overall. Maybe you disagree. I don't know. I just, it doesn't affect me. Like as soon as someone on the street says something like, Pat, I got a problem with what you said, then I'll take it seriously, you know, but, but until then it's like, eh, really? It, so how do you balance that with somebody who uh, looks at it on the surface and, uh, and, and processes what you just said and, and how you responded in the past as uh, this, this guy has contempt for a portion of his audience? Yeah, he loves uh, the, the real audience like you just described. But uh, if, somebody, if somebody processes it that way, how do you respond to that? How well, would I you think, respond well, to it? Well, I think it's, it's a... It's um, a mischaracterization to say that, oh, you, you hate a certain portion of your audience because I have a different opinion about it. Like, I don't understand that. I, I disagree with Ian all the time on the podcast about things. We've gotten to arguments on the podcast. I still love Ian. I still respect Ian. I don't hate Ian because of that. And, and I, I have big political differences with my friends. I still respect them. I still love them. So if, so if people have a problem with something I say, you know, that's I, I think that I hate them because I have a different opinion. Mm -hmm. That's not on, I think at that point, that's not on me anymore because if we had a conversation in person, they would not say the things they'd say to me online. I can guarantee you that either because either they didn't have the force of will to do that or they realize in person that it's so silly. I'm a very affable person, I think overall. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. But why, so why do you think it is that way that, 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 that some people will, cause like you Cause said, YouTube you have is, a, cause YouTube uh, festers uh, a toxic environment. YouTube does not is not conducive to nuanced thought and, and nuanced opinion. It's not. Social media is not. Facebook is not. Twitter is not. It's all quick. Uh, take things out of context. No room for nuance. Go. Because that's what how would be a better do. format. Not Where YouTube. Do you think, well, uh, sure, for, but I mean, what would what would offer uh, an opportunity to explore nuance in a way that would well, make the podcast, this stuff happen less? Let me let me t let me tell you how I knew uh, a lot of the outrage was bullshit that happened. Because we lost almost no patrons at the time. We, we did not see it really a real dip in the net, the people listening to the podcast. The podcast uh, subscriber numbers listens stayed about the same at the time. They understood the podcast audience is different than the YouTube audience. And so they understood what we were saying. And even if we weren't, if, even if, if they thought we were, we were over the line, they were listening to us for the past five, six years. They know that Ian and I go off the handle at times. From, so why is this the one thing that it should be uh, the one that dooms our career, as some YouTubers say, because that's their audience. They they don't want us to have a countering point that might be, in, even though we were, might get a little little fiery about it. The more mature ar uh, you know argument saying that it's not the end of the world that a mobile game's being developed. It's not. Life goes on. It's not the end of the world that the new Pokemon game doesn't have every single Pokemon that ever existed in it, and and that's fine for a. Uh, for Twitter or on a podcast, but for YouTube, those opinions are dangerous opinions to to the 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 angry you know gaming YouTubers because their audience is more reactionary, and that's not that that doesn't uh, that doesn't jive with what they're used to hearing. They're used to hearing everything's angry and everything's wrong, and my life is now in danger because of it. Do you think that this is unique to uh, like a subculture of gaming, or that this sort of pocket exists no matter what? sort of you know group um, you're talking about i think there's always there's always pockets of of sort of um i don't want to say just angry disenfranchised people that uh because ian's been a part of some of it in the past I, I i won't get into it but there used to be you know angry every form has the angry forum posters you know and, and forums have been around forever i don't think it's unique to youtube but there's always going to be it's, it's like the yelp thing right who's the most likely to leave uh, uh reviews uh people that either had a really good review or people that had a horrible review. 95% okay. of people that had, ah, pretty good, or it was all right, they're not going to leave a review because they're not angry enough or emotional enough to do so mm -hmm. because they are well-balanced people that get on with their lives. If I have a family and a good job and I'm trying to you know, care about other people in my life, why? I, I, who has time or the, the motivation to go online 
and be angry and and like have alt accounts and troll accounts to go at people on YouTube that I disagree with. Like, what are the? Have you met someone in your? Are you friends with any person like that? Like, do you, I don't think so. Do you personally I, I know? This is, I can't you, imagine that. No. Oh, I, I know a bunch. <laughs> you do? Okay. <laughs> uh, probably five or six now. Um. So tell me about. Yeah. So tell me about them without getting specific about them. Uh, uh like what? Well, I mean, like, are they are they happy with themselves? They see it as a fun time. Is it yeah. like a recreation to them? Uh, overwhelmingly, um, it's people separating, uh, separating talking about a certain thing from whatever their public life is, you know, and not wanting to cross streams, basically. And so, you know, they're not. It's not like a special hobby, um, but they want to be able to be honest without any blowback, like with their friends and family and job and stuff like that. I mean, it's so, not. So they'd know. say, so they know they should be embarrassed by their behavior then outright because they're no, hiding. They're, absolutely I, not. No. If they realize no, 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 that no. my fam, my family and friends might look down upon this behavior. They don't think they're, they're somewhat ashamed of it. Mm, no, if you're not, no. A, if you're not ashamed, why would you hide? If it's in the context, like uh, people I know do it on political stuff on both sides too, um, which I'm trying to come up with a unifying factor here and can't because it's a split. Uh, but they don't want to like have political fights with, you know, their friends and family and stuff. And so there's nothing wrong with what they're saying. They're not saying inappropriate stuff. They're just segmenting it out. Okay, so so you're you're parsing out political discussion versus I'm talking about trolling. I'm talking about people that like have troll accounts just to go after people. That that to me is is the step beyond what you're saying. Well, I want to have a political discussion about I'm a conservative. I'm, I'm afraid my parents are liberal or vice versa, so I don't want to upset people. Does that make sense? Versus just posting like memes because I disagree with someone being a conservative or someone being a liberal, and just going on a meme hunt. <laughs> I think oh, oh, I you yeah, lost me. You I, I had a blip. Uh, I'm sorry. I thought, you, I thought thing... you were deep in thought at first, but I don't know if you heard me. <laughs> <laughs> Not that deep. No, no, no. I, I, uh, you froze out on me, or I froze out on you when you were saying parsing. Parsing was uh, the uh, last word that out, I heard. What well, you said, like maybe hiding your political affiliation versus yeah. outright trolling and, and fucking with people. There's a difference. Right. Right. Um. Yeah, I mean, I do know a guy who who has uh, a, a really great account where he does just kind of stir things up to be funny because he just plain likes it. <laughs> it's nothing it's wildly like, inappropriate. It wouldn't like it really upset anybody, but it's garbage, you know, trash posting on Twitter. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that and, that, and that's uh, a hobby. So okay, that's his recreation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but do you think that? Uh, do you think that? These these people are ever ever right. Is it possible that they ever have a point? They could, but even if they're even if they're they're right in spirit, their their um their aggression makes it not worth listening to. I mean, that's just the bottom line because people can say like, uh, I disagree with what you have to say, and I can respect that, I can respect that opinion. But the moment you you call me or anyone you call someone a cuck, why should I listen to you anymore? Like why? Because you're not coming from a place of of constructive criticism. You're coming from a place of just attacking someone and trying to trying to make them feel worse about themselves for having an opinion that you don't personally like. There's a there's a difference. Like don't I I, I always go by the rule. Don't ever say something you wouldn't say to someone in person online. That's that's mm-hmm. just the bottom line. It does seem impossible to deal with trying to have what you dis- described as kind of like a nuanced conversation. That I do agree that podcasts allow for. I mean that's the whole point. <laughs> Of what, of, right now. of what we're yeah. doing right now. Well, between between um, us, uh, you know, the be- audience uh, can't do really anything. That's that's exactly us, the yeah. point I was going to make. Is yeah. that like we can do that right now between the three of us? But it is completely impossible in in all regards to do this with every single random person you don't know who tweets at you. And yeah. even to start a conversation, for instance, on Twitter with somebody. Like I've tried to have like a nuanced discussion a- about <laughs> about something that's not even controversial at all. Sure. Mm-hmm. Like I tried to have a conversation one time with somebody who was going after me for something that I said about fashion uh, of all things, <laughs> about like the fashion industry. And I started- Bell to- bottoms are not coming back, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. How dare when you? I think of fashion critiques, I think of, uh, of all Kev- the Vsauce's. Kevin Lieber, yeah. yeah. Primarily Kevin Lieber, Vsauce too, yes. But after like the eighth back and forth with this guy, I was like, man, this is just drilling a hole 
straight into my day that I don't (laughs) need and it's not helping anybody. Well, you also know the motivation of that person because you can have people following you like me. I have people that follow me that every once in a while I recognize them because they'll take little pot shots at me. And they're trying to do it to get their own little cloud of like, oh, well, I got Pat's attention or or, or maybe I secretly don't, don't like Pat. This happens to me like almost every month or so. I don't block the person necessarily because maybe they're getting out some anger, but it's directed at me. So you can quickly figure out whether or not they want a real conversation because when you try to be constructive or offer them assistance in some way, they don't respond or they don't get back to you. So at that point, I'm like, well, then it is what it is. So I, I think going back to social media being bullshit, um, you have to think of it as it could be constructive, but mostly it's it's a uh, fleeting just because the more you think about it, the more it just wears you down. And it is a time sink. There's people that are addicted, obviously, to Instagram. Yeah. Um, people uh, probably more so than anything else. Instagram is made to be addictive because it's constantly photos. You don't even have to read. It's just photos you're seeing. And so it's yeah. meant to be addictive. Um, and TikTok uh, is a nice balance too, where it plays on that quick photo thing, but with such short form video. Like I've been, I talked to uh, some people the other day who were on the younger side and all of them were like, yeah, I can't stop scrolling through TikTok. I can't uh, stop. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I guess Snapchat's probably the same way because they're like quick, what is it 15 seconds or whatever? That's sort of, is yeah. that what TikTok is as well? That's sort of like they decided that's, the, the, the sweet balance of getting your attention, but being uh, long enough to do something worthwhile, I guess, because six seconds isn't, what was it? What was the one that WWE tried to do? Like tout it was like, oh, no, yeah. they tried to do something called tout. It was like combination of like shouting and tweeting. It was like eight second videos or six second. Video. It lasted like six <laughs> months. It, you know, was, so, but we found the sweet spot or Instagram, I guess is just, well, just photo delivering uh, you and you go, you go out there uh, this isn't uh, you, I'm going to be yelling at clouds old man you go out and you see the younger generation constantly on their phone they're just probably going through their Instagram feed I know how we're getting off topic of people being angry at me on the internet but this is what I'm going to say about people being angry at me at the, on the internet uh, if, if I'm not if I'm not getting people emotionally invested one way or the other I'm not doing my job um, I'm just not I'm not effective at conveying information and getting people emotional whether it's happy or sad or angry I must be doing something right, and and I sort of hang my hat on sort of the enemies that I've made in my career uh, are mostly I would say garbage people. I could say that, so I don't mind upsetting those people. I don't upset people that I respect or like. Like mm-hmm. once I once I upset Kevin for doing something, then okay, I have to look at that, or upset <laughs> James, or upset you know uh, Norm Caruso, or upset Pixel Dan, or upset Ian. like once I cross that line, okay, I must be if I'm if I'm. Yeah. If I'm making bad actors angry enough to do vid- uh, videos about me, I don't mind that because I'd rather be that counterbalance force to that in the in the universe, I guess. Right? I mean, sh- should I be a losing sleep over it? Would you? I don't know. I, I don't think so. I certainly hope not. And I hope that, that you weren't because that's really kind of why I wanted to bring it up. I've never been embroiled in anything remotely like that i mean i make math videos so well i mean like when you say that's why i said about like embroiled i don't understand what that means because if i don't look at twitter that day i don't know what's happening i remember i called up a couple of friends on youtube and they didn't know what was happening they weren't trying it right so it's it's not real it's it's, it isn't i i mean i'm not trying to put down the people's emotions or or not validate that some of them could be correct but it's not real until it is I, I mean, that's it's to me. It's, it was glorified forum posts. Unless I'm engaging with it myself, you know what I mean. I've had people make videos about me six, seven, eight years, saying I hate Pat. He's arrogant or what have you. And it's like, okay, yeah, I, have that <laughs> have that opinion. I'm not going to change. <laughs> right. I'm doing something right. I don't know. I'm I have that brass jersey attitude. Some people think it's endearing. Some people don't like it. But at least at least I'm honest, and I'll, I'll let you know where you stand. You know, how, at the end of the day, we'll, at the end of the day, we'll, we'll just have a drink about it and laugh. <laughs> how has your brash Jersey attitude played out in San Diego? Because, you know, I lived on the West Coast for a little bit and I found it to be an awkward fit for me also coming, you know, from the East Coast where, yeah, you do tell somebody like it is because you, who has the time to beat around the bush? But on the West Coast, I felt like nobody is telling anybody how it is and it's um, it's all just kind of like glad handing and uh and, and like beating around the bush is like the name of the game out there 
sort of the passive aggressive thing versus yeah passive aggressive. Totally. I don't know. I always, I always see myself as a combination. Of, this is gonna be weird. I think of myself as a combination of, of West and East Coast because as much as, you, as I could be brash and forward, um, there's people in Jersey that are make me look like I'm a child when it comes to this. You know, I, I'm I I think I'm I think I'm very empathetic a lot more so than you know a lot of people that I grew up with in the family. They don't realize that oh, people, other people have feelings and maybe you should back off. So I guess I've adapted well enough. Um, I mean, with women, I've done okay because some women actually like the fact that you're direct and say what you mean and don't have time to bullshit. As well, uh, women that I've spoken to, uh, some, they hate the fact that there's guys that don't know what they want or don't say what they want and are wishy-washy. And, and a lot of guys, you know, the West Coast attitude, it's more wishy-washy. And I'm not saying I'm an alpha alpha male but i think i'm definitely more in that type a personality than the b where i'll just lay sort of step back and let things happen obviously you know i've sort of created my own business where i do things for myself and so i'm probably not the best example to speak upon it but i think some people deep down respect honesty because they're not used to seeing it um or aren't used to it so i don't know maybe you had a bad experience kevin i mean i'm in san diego that's a more moderate area of California than like San Francisco. You know, it's a military town. We have a Republican mayor in San Diego. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it or not. I don't know. Uh, how do you think this has played out uh, professionally? Like, because because when you're talking about not everybody always being honest or direct uh, kind of in the L.A. scene last week, uh, I had I had this meeting with uh, a woman in Australia and she um, we had a really honest conversation. Uh, she's like, oh, this is this is easier for me than most of the meetings I have with people from L.A. And, you know, that that line that nobody in L.A. ever has a bad meeting. Uh, you know, it's always like this is amazing and we're going to work together no matter sure. how big how a awful of crap sure. that meeting just was. Um, that's that's super frustrating. So do you think it's been professionally useful to you to have that attitude going in you guys you guys must think i'm some sort of like personality monster i mean be, <laughs> am i am i really the outlier <laughs> when it comes to a youtube personality where i'm this direct um you're the only person that we've talked to i think so far on the create unknown that's made the leap from east to west coast i'm pretty okay. sure i think so I think um, um well justine yeah. came from the east coast and went to, yeah, yeah. to the west coast but I don't work right. with people like out of LA. Like, I mean, the people I work with, I'm friends with people all across. My best friends, I see three, four times a year at conventions. Mm -hmm. you know, my, my, one of my best friends from, from college is in Pennsylvania. So I do have local friends. Uh, here's the thing. I know my personality puts off people. I do know that. But the people that it's sort of like once you get to know me, you understand me, and then you you go, oh, wow. Okay, he's not a, he's it's always like, oh, wow, Pat's not as big as an asshole as I thought. And, I, and I've seen that online, especially in forums like Nintendo Age. Once you meet, it's like, okay, I see the charm there. I see, I see what's going on there, for better or for worse. I, I mean, in terms of the creative process, I've rubbed YouTubers the wrong way. I, I guarantee you I have. But at the end of the day, and this goes towards uh, myself and to people that I have problems with or issues, I think a person is judged best by who surrounds them and who their friends are. You can best judge a person by that. I think that is sort of like the grade A way of saying, okay, what's this person like? Well, who, who who's he around? Who respects him? Who does he work with? Yeah, I don't, I don't surround myself with bad people. I don't associate with bad people. No, no, no. no I, don't. I, I, I definitely think that that's a great way of, of, that's a great litmus test. I guess I was just asking selfishly because because <laughs> I went from the East Coast to the West Coast and then I came back to the East Coast partly because <laughs> like I did I didn't vibe all that well with people on the West Coast at least really? at least in LA I've never spent any time in San Diego maybe it's different did you was it the fact that you were a little bit too real for people in LA because I don't think you have an aggressive personality Kevin no I'm not an aggressive person like at all but. I get annoyed when I feel like people are wasting my time. Like I feel like gotcha. my time, time is the most valuable resource uh, aside from health. Okay. So you got health is at the top you got, of the you pyramid. Got spleen, liver, time. <laughs> yeah. Spleen, liver. Okay. And then time is right below health. And I don't like having my time wasted. And I felt like that happened a lot on the West Coast unnecessarily 
when somebody yeah. could have just said, hey, I actually am not going to do this. And yeah. the reason that I say that I am going to do this is because I'm like too passive aggressive to actually tell you that I'm not going to. And then now, now my time is my time is wasted. And as an East Coaster, uh, that bothers me. So you took meetings with like, oh, yeah, we're going to work. It's going to be great. And you're like, I know this is bullshit. I want to get out of here. This is garbage. I'd rather you just say that we're not going to see each other again or work together. Yeah, or I thought, or I was under the impression that something, yeah, we are going to work together because you told me we were, and then you ghost me for the next six months and stop replying. It's like, all right, I can't handle, I can't work this way. That could be specifically Hollywood though, right? Or the LA uh, scene. Maybe. I think there's a media, a media, like broader media component to that where it's quite a bit more common there. Yeah. Because you're not, you're afraid of pissing off anyone. So you're always on on eggshells, even (laughs) when you know it's bad. Yeah, we'll do lunch. You're not going to do lunch. Right. (laughs) There's a a YouTuber. um, Yeah, I can tell the story. He won't care. Andre Meadows. Good. uh, One of my best friends, I guess, in the content creation sphere. Andre Meadows, Black Nerd Comedy. When I first met him, um, it was at this like uh, video game meetup group. Um, outside of LA, SC3, Southern Cali- Southern California, whatever. This was like 2012 or so, 13 maybe. And he gave me one of those lines like, oh yeah, we should work together. And he meant it though at the time. But I, I was like, this guy doesn't mean this. So I had the wrong reaction to him. This is before mm-hmm. I was friends with him. And so I didn't get it. But just because I knew he was from LA, I was like, oh, he has that sort of like LA thing. Yeah, yeah, we should work together. I was like, pfft. Yeah, he's just bullshitting me, <laughs> you know, so I can see how it is. And then, yeah, it, and it, it can be frustrating talking to people that live like he lives, I think, in the Valley and people live in Burbank or L.A. It's frustrating if you're not of that mindset. I, I hear people like, oh, yeah, L.A. is not for me. I got to move. I got to get out of here. And it's not just for business wise. It's friend wise. It's hard to make yeah. lasting friendships because yes, that bleeds into. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I don't. I want to be friends with everyone, not piss everyone. But you're not really friends with the pe- people. Then it's just like, yeah, no, no, I'll no. See, I'll or, see like once every three months or whatever. I don't know how it works. I don't. I don't have L.A. friends, quote unquote. Where like maybe you'll see them and do cocktails, and, and they but they won't come to your birthday party. I personally <laughs> don't do friends like that. You're either my friend or you're not. Yeah. You know, I don't do like wide webs of acquaintances. But I guess that's how the L.A. thing is. You know everyone. That's, that's why I, I I wanted to probe you earlier on on that's, this stuff with sexy. like the attitude on it. Well, it is a little bit. I can, <laughs> I can drop down an octave and get it real hot. Uh, but I, so what I, what I was hearing when you were saying that is you pretty much saying I have this kind of quick filter or heuristic that's that's going to be like a really efficient way to get me with the people who I'm compatible with. Uh, really, like, you, you, you're putting some computer science terms in there and some uh, AI. I have a just heuristic, that a, right? like a quick filter that like, you know, so I don't, I don't take it as like a brass Jersey thing so much as I'm going to be direct about this. And because you said it with the audience of the podcast as well, I'm going to be direct with my audience, whether they like it or not. And it's going to filter out some subs who probably shouldn't be subs. Uh, It's going to filter out potential friends who I wouldn't have wanted to be friends with anyway. Uh, And that it gets you to these relationships that are just kind of what you are looking for in the first place. Well, yeah, but isn't that what what you go back to when people say be yourself? I mean, like, why would you not want to be your like, like, why would I want to fake myself in order to get a YouTube audience or podcast audience? And there are definitely YouTubers that do that. A lot Absolutely. Of people do. Yeah. I couldn't live with myself because I feel shame. I guess that's a nice <laughs> way I can put it. And there's a lot of people that don't. They do. I mean, they're, they're going back to whatever that angry gamer article was where they asked people straight out. Like, no, I don't really care about this stuff that much, but I know that an audience is going to watch it. Yeah. So, I, so they're going to pretend to be angry about it. I couldn't get on here and pretend to be angry about things. I mean, because I'm, I don't know, man, I'm too old. Yeah. I, and it's the, just not, the, other, I mean, I, the friend thing, uh, when, when we were talking about that, I, I also have always found it weird when people are friends because it's, it benefits them. It's like, oh, I'm friends with so and so because I know they can advance my career, like, or, sure. or whatever it is. Uh, that, and then once they don't anymore, then, oh, I don't have time for them. Like, oh, there's been three, th- three big so- YouTubers that did that to me. One, one who got in a little bit of hot water in May of this year, uh, <laughs> quite, you might know who I'm referring to, um, that, that definitely did that where it was like, oh, let's say I'm 50,000 subs ahead of you. You don't exist anymore to me, even though mm-hmm. you knew me when I had no subscribers at all. Um, you know, and that's happened 
three YouTubers that I was friends with. Like, I mean, like I have their f- phone numbers in my phone that like I, I knew them 10 years ago, nine years ago, eight years ago that just, yeah, you know, they'll say hi to you. Oh yeah. Hi, Pat. But it's almost like they're ashamed to know that at some point they didn't have as big of a, whatever influence or career that you are. It, it, some people, some people think that way. I right. feel sorry for them. I just do because then you're, you're never going to be fulfilled. No. There's always going to be someone else out there that either someone you know or don't know that that you're trying to achieve that that sort of level of fame. But at the end of the day, you're just a hollow soul. It's the best way I can put it. Yeah. I've seen it we, happen. I've seen I've seen people that I collaborated with, you know, after the fact or, or just like begrudgingly. I mean, begrudgingly saying hello to me in person. <laughs> oh my, what does that look like? What does a begrudging hello look like? Oh, oh, hi, Pat. Like, you can tell, like, I have to shake this person's hands. <laughs> right. And I know it's awkward for them. And I love awkwardness because that's reality. And so I'm like, oh, hey, what's going on, buddy? Uh-huh. Knowing that, you know, you, you wouldn't return a phone call for me unless I said, like, I'm going to make you $5,000 on something. Yeah. Or, or I'm going to have you in- invited to a convention that I help put on. Like, yeah. That's happened. Like, yes. And it's we but we are <laughs> here, this this is this is what I think what people don't understand is that this is not a YouTube thing. This is any industry where uh, egos get involved with with any creative process, music, TV, movies, I get even probably theater and or art where there's always people that think that I have to get ahead and who cares about the people below me? I'm going to step on them and get above. And that's why would you? Why would you be any different? And it's shocking me that that the the, the audience out there think it might be different just because it's a different platform that's more more down to earth. No, the the personalities don't change regardless of the media platform. They, we are all the same. If I was in, in in movies and knew these same people in movies, they would act the same exact way. As soon as I'm bigger than Pat, you know, they, they did the sequel to Home Alone. They're bigger than me, or what have you. And, and Pat, you're just an extra. Fuck off. Here's a kick. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, we talked about we talked about networking. And this this same topic in, in very similar, uh, not exactly the same, but very similar, where it's it's like, hey, what do you do with the people who were you were useful to them in a networking kind of professional scenario? And then eventually there's some distance, whether uh, it's from them getting big or whatever. Uh, or do you put up with the jerky, unbearable people for some kind of professional gain? You know, and, and it's. I, that's a uh, personal question. I mean, that's up yeah. to you. It's up to your code of ethics, your morals. I mean, these yeah. these YouTubers that that pass me by and then you know w- wouldn't piss on me if I was on fire. Which which I'm trying to think. If I was on fire, maybe you would piss on someone because then that adds like you're not going to put out the fire with your piss. It'll just add more insult to it. I don't know. That's a weird expression. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I don't know. I just thought about that. But um, <laughs> some people would say, "Oh yeah, it's cool. I'll be I'll, I'll collab with you." And, and some people like me, I'd be like, you know what? Fuck off. <laughs> I don't need you. But I guess it also depends on where you are and whether or not you are closer to having what I like to deem or other people fuck you money, where it's like right. I'm almost at the point where I pretty much am where, you know, I don't have to, you know, shuck and jive for people in order to to get ahead and, and you know, dance like a puppet for for, you know, collaborators in there. And I, I think people realize that and. I, again, I sort of hang my hat on the fact that that you know, like uh, like people, I think respect me somewhat without knowing that like I can't do anything to help them necessarily. And I look out for my friends. I've looked out for all my friends, and I do that. It's one of that's what makes you a friend. But it's not like people realize, okay, if I talk to Pat or say associate with Pat, my YouTube you know career is going to blow up. It probably won't. If anything, it could possibly hurt you if you're caught in one of my hot takes that. Doesn't really matter, <laughs> you know. So let's let's get into the book because we're 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 kind of running out of time. We didn't even talk about uh, it yet. I want to know. Yeah. We can uh, go long. I, I haven't I know. today yet, but you know. No, it's so funny. In. It's so funny when 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 I was talking to Matt about having you on the show. I was like, I am. We do have we have to do no prep for this because. No, I know Pat and he knows me and yeah. we can talk all day about any number of <laughs> YouTube related topics. Kevin, uh, why don't we talk more than like once a year? What What is wrong with us? Would you consider us, would you, not to be as awkward, would you consider us friends or just like 
really close colleagues that sort of commiserate every once in a while. And that, that, that's not really a bad thing. I would say uh, definitely friends. And I would also say, as depressing as this may sound, I don't really talk to hardly any of my friends more than like once a year. Oh, like, I am really don't. Kevin, working yeah. constantly on Kevin, stuff. Can I, can, I, can, I, can I just hug you and just say, we got to take a break, buddy. We got to we got to find a better platform than YouTube. We got to start creating content for like Prime, Amazon, to be honest. We, it Something. really is true, though, that that I have people ask me, oh. like, how Kevin is doing and what he's doing, because, like, best friends from childhood, your best friends from childhood <laughs> will ask me for an update. And I'm like, yeah, he, he's not a talker like that. <laughs> now, Kevin, do you feel you have to? I didn't ask what your I should I should ask what your daily routine is. Um, but do you feel you have to work this hard? Is it is it purely monetary? Is it? just a career driven or do you feel like you'll be left behind if you don't or is it a combination of it i i would say and and in full disclosure 100 percent honest it's monetary like i want okay. to be able to have um enough money to not have to grind for the rest of my life um i don't want to work it nearly as hard as i do at this moment for the next 40 years so <laughs> wow okay so I'm really, I really, really welcome, work. Welcome to Podcast Beyond, and it is beyond. It's 2058. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I would love to be able to just do creatively whatever comes to mind. I'd love to wake up each day and just work on writing a book or whatever it is. And I can't do that right now. So my argument would be then, okay, how do I phrase this without being cold hearted? If oh, you know that <laughs> what you want to do and what you really want to gain is not through what you're currently doing, what's stopping you from making that sort of leap? Is it just like, okay, I got to make sure my family's secure, which which is a totally fine, acceptable answer. But I, I think what I'm trying to get at is for us, YouTube is not the end goal. It, it's It's a launch platform to other better platforms and projects. And I think that's what uh, you are probably, you figured it out already. It's just, it's just making that bridge to it. As I guess what you're still working on. Yeah. And, and, and also quite honestly, uh, Vsauce 2 is doing really, really well right now. I'm really happy with the videos that I'm making on there. It wasn't doing well a couple of years ago. And, you know, Matt has been integral in helping me revamp that into making it, uh, changing the format and making videos again that, you know, a million people will watch. So I, f and, 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 on top of that, I do get a great deal of satisfaction from the people who watch these videos because I think that I am explaining things for the first time or at least explaining them in an entertaining way in which people will enjoy learning about some of this stuff, some of these paradoxes, okay. some of these math games. So it is fulfilling for sure in that regard. Wouldn't that be a better series somewhere else? I mean, in all honesty, versus YouTube, like, don't you want millions and millions of people to to see it? Like, ten million people, like, and have them lined up to come out. Obviously, that'd be that'd be great, right? You get the funding, you do like thirteen thirty minute episodes of Vsauce, like, yeah, but dude, blow. it's it's yeah. hard. Like, let me tell you, I've had these conversations, and the people who make those decisions are scared of math. They think yeah. that nobody wants to to learn math, and they think it's boring. And they square think, one, come on, square one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not they're not writing checks for math shows, dude. Like it's not happening. So the ideas they have too, and I, I had a bunch. I had like six or seven of these conversations a couple weeks ago because I was you know doing this kind of little tour with the mindset of of exploring those options. And um, even when when people are amenable to a math type thing, their mind is not actually about the math you know it's like oh uh, what if you did x y and z with it where x y and z are things that aren't about the actual topic uh and so i there i think there's a special hmm. challenge in the content that kevin does uh, in keeping it the content that kevin does uh, rather than getting like twisted and morphed to to jam in a slot that some of those other companies and networks have i think it all that comes down to who you're talking to to fund these projects, right? Because if you go to like a traditional YouTube channel, they'll be like, no, 
But what if you got like you went to like some sort of educational association? What if you went to uh, be, get a grant through some university to produce it? I'm just I'm just spitballing here. Yeah, but those are there, all possible. There's, a, there's the, you know, or or pu public funding. You know, PBS funds the show. You know, whatever that, that could happen. So <laughs> YouTube makes us complacent. It makes content creators complacent because there's a there's an outlet to put your content on. You can upload anything you want. But that might necessarily be the best place for it, unfortunately. That may not give you the return on your time and money investment, but you know people will see it, but it may not be the proper way to get it out there. And I think a lot of us are tethered to that still. And the more, and it's a difficult leap to get off because there's a lot at risk. You're also, you're becoming almost like, you know, trying to fund like an independent movie at that point. But I think that's where solutions are probably, uh, that's where I think more of us are going to gravitate towards as we get older and realize that, yes, this isn't working anymore on this platform. You can still do maybe a similar type of content, but it's just not going to be there. Uh, like I can see your content doing well in a serialized format. You put it on Amazon Prime and people watch it. Maybe people discover it. Maybe they show their kids and at least it's another avenue of, of where people can enjoy it and you'll make some revenue there as well. You know, yeah, like there's there's still there's also just a, a large stigma against YouTubers from the traditional media side, and and yeah. and Hulu and Amazon Prime and Netflix make no mistake are still traditional media, even though it's streaming and it's new media. Everyone that's making those decisions for those new media sites come from traditional media. It's, sure. It's just a new delivery mechanism, but it's the same gatekeepers. And they look down upon YouTubers like well, pretty hardcore. I, I guess don't don't sell my YouTube show then. I mean, try to sell them. I mean, I'm being maybe naive when it comes to the process, but sell them something that, that's not traditionally a YouTube thing. And maybe that's what they'll be more, you know. But the thing uh, is, is they want so. they want like a traditional media name attached to the thing. So like if I walked into a room, okay, with Adam Savage from Mythbusters, okay? If okay. I walk into a room with Adam Savage and I say, hey, or and we do a thing together where Adam says, hey, you know, I'm Adam Savage. I had the most popular science cable television show of all time. Here's my new protege, Kevin Lieber, who has the most popular math show on YouTube. It gets millions of views. We get, we, we're going to do a show together. That's a meeting that they'll take. And that's, that's a, a project that will likely get greenlit because you have a traditional media known quantity. And then you have this like fresh face who like the kids like. But if I'm just walking in alone as this wacky YouTuber who like kids like, there's just n not a lot of urgency and excitement to, 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 you know, pass across the checkbook and open up the checkbook for a YouTuber. It just hasn't well, gone well. It hasn't what? gone well. Think, think of like okay. all of the YouTubers have tried to have TV shows, whether it's Grace Helbig or... Epic Meal Time, or even Miranda, that got yeah, canceled two after seasons. two seasons. Because like, it's different. It's different audience watching TV. I mean, that's it. Just hasn't worked uh, yet. Well, then I'll tell you the opposite. You have to go the opposite route. Then you have to get funding. You have to get investment. You got to produce it. Then you have to get distribution and sell it to after the fact. I mean, that's then that's the only other option, right? You make your show, get the funding, go out and have someone buy it after the fact. I mean, that's. That's yeah, I mean that's solution. possible. Yeah, that's just a big it's a bigger investment risk. in yeah, in time and money, honestly. But in, in the end though, it's the same result. You make what you want to make, but then yeah, you'll keep more of the profits at least. <laughs> but it's but yeah, you got to put the money on the credit cards or get the investors. Like if you said if you got like say you needed a 50 grand to make uh I don't know, tw 12 13 episodes of of mind blow or what have you. If you did that, then you could you could shop it to a uh a Hulu or get an agent to try to get it picked up by, you know, maybe someplace in Europe, some cable network would show it and you make mm -hmm. your money back that way. I mean, that's, I mean, obviously it's a lot scarier, but you it's know, an option. It's, it's an, an option. option. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, my, 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 my documentary, uh, we just signed a contract for an agency to shop it around the documentary. I invested money in, I invested time, obviously I'm hoping to recoup that, but if they sell it to a network or sell it overseas then we'll make the money back on it.
Besides, obviously, showing it on Amazon, charging for it on Amazon, selling Blu-rays, obviously. So maybe it's a mm-hmm. traditional Kickstarter slash investor route, right? I'm not trying to tell yeah. you what to do, Kevin. I'm just spitballing. I'm trying to help you. Yeah. I love you. I love you, Kevin. I, Even though I, I never talked to you. I understand. <laughs> It's just, it sounds easier. A lot of this stuff sounds easier on paper than it is. You need in some cash? What do, I, what do I got on me? What do I got on me right now? Let's, let's get started. I got three, 350 on me. No, 450 in cash. All, All right. right. I'll probably need more than that. <laughs> Pat, tell me about your book, man. What, Which one? What, uh, well, either of them. I mean, you know, the new one is really a sequel. <laughs> it, uh, it, it, I, I imagine it was the same process. What is that process like creating oh these, my, these books? Oh, God. Oh God! You know what? That's, it, that's something our patrons wanted to know too. Was uh, yeah, they they wanted you to just say what it was like to write these things. It's crazy. Let's 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 just be back up. It's not well. The first book I wrote sixty percent of the second book I wrote about fifteen percent. I hired more writers to help me because the first book almost drove drove me crazy, and did not I did not have a social life for the last year and a half to, to complete it. Just about my girlfriend hated me. Um, because I had to stay home. And that's one of the reasons I stopped going to the flea market is because I had to write and finish it. Um, it. You can say I'm a little bit of a madman because I, I get a goal in mind and I think about how do I complete this and get to this finish line, even though it, it might have a toll on me. I don't think about the toll it takes to do it. Um, so it, it's all nice and dandy to say I want to create basically Leonard Malton's film guide, but a lot more words per review for any video game system. Uh, it's tough, though, to project manage it to get to a point that's respectable and to the level of quality that I hold myself to, at least in my projects. Uh, at least nowadays, those early NES Punk videos with no lighting, maybe not. But you have to be sort of um, a perfectionist, but also a good project manager and be able to work with other people. And that and those skill sets don't usually align. Um I think with a lot of people, but for me, I guess I, I'm I'm good at project managing, so I could wrangle together other writers and have sort of a unified vision and try to hold them to that and scheduling of writing and pay them for their writing because that's what an ethical uh, editor of a book or publisher or whatever producer of a book should do is pay their contributors. Um, and so I guess the NES book was sort of a hard lesson because I realized I couldn't do it all on my own and it nearly killed me. Uh, Ian dropped off the project. Uh, and he couldn't continue with it at a certain point. I continued on. I showed, I, I went on. I hired the writers, and I got it out there. And then the response was overwhelming because I had no idea if it was going to sell. I completed most of the book before the Kickstarter in 2016. Uh, no, the Kickstarter, the Kickstarter was in, yeah, was in like March of 2016, and it came out in September of that year. And I had no idea if it was going to sell because at that point in time, there really wasn't a book like that that actually wrote and detailed and reviewed every single game in the library to that extent um, and in that format. And so I guess I learned there was an audience for the book. And so about six months later, I said, I'm going to do the sequel book, but I want I want to hire an editor up front. I want a stronger team. I want to take a step back because this is going to kill me if I do this again. I can't write 450 reviews again. Man, I can write like, I think I said originally 130. Then I went back to like 80 and even that was overwhelming for me to keep track of all that. Um, while doing a pot, two podcasts and what have you, everything else. So I, I, I guess I'm, it's weird because I, kn- I know it's a major accomplishment in people's eyes. It doesn't really affect me as much as it should now that it's out. I mean, it literally went on Amazon for sale the, the, the morning that we we're recording this. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's just like, okay, that's done. What's next? Which I think is both good and bad because I sort of don't get complacent with what I've done, but I should relax and enjoy w- what what the accomplishment was and, and that my team helped accomplish. So I don't know if this gets you the answer to your question at all. I'm kind of rambling right now, which I tend to do on a podcast. I guess it can work. But um, I, I am proud of it, though, because I do honestly believe it's the best book of its kind on the market because there are competitive, competing books. Mine has the best writing. Mine has has the best information. Mine you know, has, has the best format and layout or else I wouldn't do the book if I didn't believe that. So how did you uh, find the writers and how did you get like the graphics, like the screenshots for everything? What What is that process like? For the Super Nintendo book, uh, 99.9% of the screenshots were created by the writing team and and myself and the editors uh, in emulators because we really don't care. It's like, oh, why capture on a CRT? It's blurry. It's not going to come out well in the print format. It doesn't matter. No one really sense. cares if the, col- if the colors are 1% off. Um, there was a team of seven or eight writers for the NES book, even though most 
only averaged about 10 reviews each besides Ian who did 150 and I did 450. Um, so for the second book, I, I got back like the four or five best writers from there. And then I hired four more, four or five more writers. So there was a team of 10 writers for the, for this super Nintendo book. And they just tried out. I put out a call. I said, I prefer professional experience. If not submit your writing and me and my editor Ashen went through the writings and we picked out the best writers, uh, to, to do it. And then that's how, that's how it was accomplished. And then the graphics were created by my buddy, uh, Yoshi, who's now back from Singapore, who literally worked on the Death Star for episode nine. And he did the great, he did the, some of the cover art and he created CG carts of every Super Nintendo game, him and a couple wow. of assistants. That's yeah. crazy. So, so I mean, I shouldn't say that every cartridge in that book is not a picture, but most people would not be able to tell that. Most people can't tell uh, that, you know, on, on the cover here, that that's a, not a, uh, a real Super Nintendo. You wouldn't be able to tell. So. No, it looks amazing. But it comes down to like two and a half years of writing, project managing, uh, error checking, sending things back to writers, making sure writers are on schedule, uh, you know, dealing with not complaints, but issues with certain uh, writings that aren't up to speed. Because when you have 10 different people writing, you still have a sort of unified sort of uh, vision of what a, a standard review should be. And yes, you, you allow writers to have their flavor of writing, but they, they shouldn't be that radically different from each other. You know, mm-hmm. it's not as dry as Letter Malton's film guide. There is room for flourishing with uh, with the reflection section and being more funny and more anecdotal and uh, having a little bit more of a historical uh, 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 flavor to it. But you still have to have all the writers on point. Um, and it's a lot of writing to keep track of. And then when you come, it comes to selling it. I know that with the first book, you did a lot of conventions. How in the world are you traveling around the country with these heavy friggin' books? I have, I have <laughs> what one is of that those, like? One of those Hank <laughs> Hank Pym little uh, devices to shrink them? No, oh, no, they, they they get shipped out from warehouses, and I sort of do like this pat math where I figure out, okay, I'm going to a convention that's in a certain area and has this many people that went there last year i should be able to sell this many amount of books and it usually works out so i've only sold it at two conventions so far next year i'll probably do my last heavy convention run of my career which i mean like doing eight to ten in a year because i've been doing that for like eight nine years and it's worn me down um so yeah most of the time i end up having a couple books left and so i you know or like maybe eight books and so i wholesale them to a couple of shops locally that know me or they can sign them and then pay me when they sell a couple places still owe me money you gotta pay Pat at some point. Uh, I'll send I'll send Frank after you with a PVC pipe. Anyway, um, <laughs> but um, most of the time it works out. Or the convention, I, I I know the I know the people that run these conventions now. Some of these conventions I've gone to four or five times, so they'll hold my books for me. They'll hold ten mm-hmm. or twenty books for me for the next year. They won't steal them. Probably it's not worth that much pain to cross me. I guess I don't know. Uh, but no, it's it's it is tiresome though, just because I gotta get there, I gotta unload them, I gotta sign them all and get them set up. But this is the business I chose. As uh, Rothman from uh, Godfather 2 uh, so eloquently spoke. Yeah. Well, I would love to talk all day, but, you know, uh, I don't think that we can. I think we all have, uh, you know, books to sign and videos to edit. <laughs> hey, and, give, me, uh, give me, we only had one Patreon question, right? There's not another one you want to do? We're going we're gonna to do more. We're going to go through our oh. Patreon wormhole right now. It's gonna, and, it's uh, gonna feel weird. It's gonna feel a little strange at first, but when you land, it, it's it's gonna be worth it, and you'll settle. Yeah, it's that feeling warm, when, 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 you're, when you're in a car on a road and you, and you go down like a steep hill, you get that like gut yeah. feeling, like whoa. Yeah, <laughs> little it's, it's exactly like, little like scary, that. but kind of pleasant too. Yeah. yeah, so get ready for that. We'll we'll do that right now, and we'll hit our patrons' questions for Pat. The wormhole exists at patreon.com slash thecreateunknown. Please join us over there. If you can't make it, well, that's okay, too. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Leave comments. Do all of the things that, that you want to do. And uh, until next time, we'll see you, Space Cowboys. Thanks, Pat. Bye! Thanks for listening to The Create Unknown. There's more episode waiting for you, but to keep listening, sign up at patreon.com slash thecreateunknown. You can hear the rest of our conversation as well as unlock the ad-free feed, get exclusive content, join the idea baby gang, and more.